the running the business had become miserable and I had been doing it for so long I didn't even realize I was miserable and that made me it made me realize you know why am I doing this? business of architecture episode 242 hello architect nation I'm Enoch Sears and this is the podcast for architects and designers where you'll discover tips strategies and secrets for running an impactful and hyper profitable architecture practice if you haven't already Get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one solution for your architecture firm. From project management to accounting, time and expenses, billing and business intelligence, Core makes work easy. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today we speak with an architect who three years ago realized that his passion for the practice of architecture was dying. Perhaps you felt this way or you feel this way now. Perhaps you feel that drafting away, arranging details on sheets or answering RFIs isn't what you are cut out to do. Or maybe you just spend too much time doing the small stuff that saps your energy instead of the work that energizes and excites you the reason you got into architecture in the first place. Instead of the excitement of working with clients and designing new projects, today's guest felt like he was jumping from meeting to meeting and project to project without making real meaningful progress in his business. He had a fine income, but it wasn't great. He was feeling burnout in a major way and knew that something had to change. Today's guest is architect Dan Shear, founder and owner of Shear and Associates, a firm with two offices based out of South Carolina. Dan's firm focuses on renovations and historic preservation. Dan is raw and transparent in this interview, and I thank him for that. He shares his journey to creating a practice that he loves with exciting projects and clients. His firm now empowers his life instead of controlling it. His staff are happier and purposeful, and his clients appreciate and value the work of the firm. Dan, welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you. It's good to be here. So help our listeners understand a little bit about you and about your firm. Um, well, I'm a you know relatively small architectural practice. I've been in business for 27 years now. And, um, you know, over the years have grown in, up to as many as 12 to 15 employees, uh, then, then, then back down to, to almost none, um, based on basically what was happening in the economy. You know, if, if we, if the economy was good, I had many employees. If the economy wasn't good, I didn't have many employees. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, over the years have trimmed our, our, our specialty, our, our niche down into, uh, historic preservation, renovation type projects. We still do some other work, but but our our bread and butter is the renovation work, uh, some urban infill things like that. Um, we now I now have two full time employees, and we use consultants for a, for a good bit of our our outsource. We outsource drafting now. We outsource all of our engineering, and try to you know keep our core group of people They're very talented. Uh, they're fairly expensive people. They work extremely hard, and then the things they can't handle, we we sub out and they oversee to you know the rest of our our, our team. What inspired you to start your own practice? Tell me the journey of going from perhaps working for someone else to starting your own gig. How did that happen? Well, it was not a very well planned out um, endeavor. Uh, I, you know, I finished college. I had to go work for another architect. Um, to do my apprenticeship before I could take the exam. And uh, the gentleman I worked for was a, was a good architect. He was a good person. I enjoyed working with him. But in my mind, he was too, I don't know if reserved is the right, right, the right um, term, but he, he was, he, he th- th- seemed to me like he didn't really pursue certain avenues in our architecture from design or, or client relationships or whatever that, that I thought it should, even as, even as a very inexperienced architect, um, it just seems like we were leaving a lot out there that, that unfinished almost. Um, and it frustrated me. Um, we weren't designing as well as we could design. We weren't building relationships with clients that we could have been. And so, you know, when, when the time came for me to take my licensing exam, I, I, and, and pass it, 
um, within about four months, I had already lined up two clients, bought all my computers and software and said, okay, bye, starting a business. That was, that was the journey. Um, wasn't the best way to do it, but it, but it, you know, it got me out and, and doing my own thing. You know, I had to just, uh, you know, uh, I know this is very unusual for, for architects, but I was a little bit arrogant, maybe a little bit cocky and, you know, thinking, well, if my boss can do this, I can surely do it a lot better. So that's, that's how the practice started. Um, uh, fortunately I did, I did have a, a pretty good, um, ability to, to, um, pick out a, a good client or a good, you know, a good group to work with. So it eased my learning curve because I didn't know anything when I started. And uh, the, the people I was working with, though, were, you know, most of them were, had been in business for a while, um, kind of brought me along slowly. And the building, the, the, the business just started to grow after a couple of years of really, you know, banging my head against the wall, trying to figure everything out. Business started to grow and, and we learned and, you know, who knows how much money we lost during that learning curve, but um, we, uh, you know, we, we started moving forward and really, you know, became a pretty good architectural firm as far as the work we produced and the type of, the type of projects we were doing. Now, when you first started out, did you have any jobs in the hopper already or did you just go out without anything in the pipeline and just try to create stuff from scratch? I had one project. Um, it was a, a re- very large residential project for a friend of a friend and on a, on a lake here in South Carolina. And then I had a rela- good, re- good relationship with a, um, a technical university here um, with their, the guy that was in charge of all their facilities and maintenance. And it, it's a state-run facility. So you either put your name in a hat with 40 other firms and go after the big stuff or you go, let me, you know, let me – put my name in here for the little jobs and the competition wasn't as great. And, you know, they distribute the smaller jobs out to say five or six different architects. The small jobs, I mean, it might be a $50,000 renovation. It might be a quarter of a million dollar renovation, but it's relatively small, but there was a continuous flow of, of these smaller projects. So that's, that's where I started doing the room project school and, uh, and the larger residential project. So Dan, you and I, we've worked together quite a bit. You've been through our Architecture Freedom Formula program. And I just want to go back. We're still talking about those early days. I'd like to know, you said you had this growth curve, this learning time where you're beating your head against the walls, as you said. Looking back now, you know, what kind of advice would you have given to your younger self, maybe to speed up that learning curve for you? Um, find a mentor, find some help. Find somebody that, that's already been through the process um, or a, a team of, of people uh, and, and don't try to do it on your own because you, you're figuring it out is much more um, painful than being, than being taught. Uh, financially painful, uh, mistakes on projects, not meeting deadlines because you just don't have everything set up like it needs to be set up. You're, you're, you know, one day you're worried about making, you making a deadline. The next day you realize, oh, no, I've got to pay all my bills now. And there was no true, um, system in place. And, you know, that's one thing I wish I had done 25, 26 years ago. Now, a lot of so people might say, Dan, I, I don't know of a mentor and I can't afford a coach. What would you say to those people that, that have these stories or reasons why they, they think that that isn't an option for them? Um, well, first of all, you know, go look again, the going through the, the, the program with you guys, I just started looking, you know, I woke up one day and said, this isn't working. There has to be a better way. I started researching architects, architectural marketing. I started doing some, you know, just looking online for help with architecture and business. There wasn't much out there. And I came, that's when I came across your site, started receiving the emails, reading some things. It took me a long time to really buy in that I needed to go ahead and join this group, this organization and get some help. But when I did, things changed very rapidly. So yeah, it's just, you know, um, there is help out there. Don't, don't use that as an excuse is what I would say. What were the things in your business that were causing that discomfort that made you want to reach out and look for another solution? Um, well, at the time I wasn't sure what it was. I, I didn't know why we couldn't seem to make things go more smoothly <laughs> now having been through what I have been through, we had, we had very few systems, processes, procedures in place 
to deal with things as they came in. So every time anything happened, it was like the first time, even if it was the 15th time. If I had a new employee or if it was a, one employee that had worked on it on these projects, but this employee had never done whatever this was, submitted drawings at this municipality or, you know, converted certain type of drawings over to our standards, they didn't know what to do. And everybody was asking everyone else. And again, it, the, the deadlines got pushed back because there was a, you know, what I, in my mind, what everybody should no, no, not everybody knew because we hadn't done a very good job of communicating that to everyone. So that, that was, that was one of the things that, that was a big problem. We didn't have a, a repetitive system or process where the things that we do all the time were set up and, and we said, this is how we're going to do it every time. And this is how everybody does it. And everybody knows where to go find this information. So they, if they don't know how to do it, they, you know, we, we didn't have that in place. And I didn't know that that's, that's not what I, you know, I didn't know I didn't have it. You know, I thought we had it, but we didn't. You know, we had a way we we had a kind of way of doing things. It wasn't a system. How did that affect the business? Um, the business was a struggle for me personally. Um, it was I was a fifty to sixty hour week worker guy. Um, I did marketing. I did business development. I did the you know I was involved in the accounting and bookkeeping. I did design work. I did drafting, filling in the gaps, uh, going to meetings, um, handling any emergencies. And so for me personally, it was extremely stressful. Wake up at 3 a.m. thinking about something that needed to be done that day, that there was no way it was going to happen that day. All right, what do I do? Well, I get up at 3 a.m. and I go start doing it. And so the, the, the stress level was through the roof for you. And this was, this was going on, this went on for 15 years where I was, whether I was a big firm or a small firm, it was always the same. I was not putting my employees in position. I was not empowering them to do the things they needed to do. So I was have to, having to do that. And how did you find running your business like that? How did that affect the personal side of life? It was, it was again, it, it, it all ties together. If, if, you're, if you're struggling and stressed out at work, you, you bring it home. Um, you know, I, I probably fussed at my children sometimes when they didn't deserve it because I was frustrated with something at work. Um, usually it was, you know, we didn't have any huge major problems. It wasn't like huge lawsuits or anything. It was just constant little things that weren't being taken care of. And, you know, it, it does, it affects, it affects your, it affects everything. You don't, don't sleep well. You don't enjoy your, your time with your loved ones as much. So Dan, you said you dealt with this for 15 years looking back at those 15 years, what are your thoughts and feelings now as you look back on, on those years? Well, first of all, I'm a little frustrated with you for not starting the business of architecture sooner. So that, that I'm a little mad at you. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 you know, I wish I had had the, the vision or the foresight or somebody just to tell me, this is what you need to do. Go out, change the way you're doing this because you're doing the same thing over and over again. And that's not, I mean, we made, we made a decent living. The income wasn't necessarily terrible, but it was not an enjoyable, you know, in fact, four or five years ago, again, right before I started really looking for some help, I was thinking, what else can I do? I don't want to do this the rest of my life. I mean, I love being an architect, but running the business and being an architect was not enjoyable. I was, I was burnt out. Tell me about the state of your business now. Well, the, the biggest thing I'd like to say about the business now is it runs very smoothly without me at the controls 24 seven. I have the, again, my two full-time employees, they have specific roles, they have titles, they know exactly what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. Uh, you know, instead of me getting 20 questions a day from each one of those, I might get three. Um, we have processes in place where if one of them really don't know what to do. Neither one of them, they, they'll ask each other first, have you run into this? Have you run into this? If, if neither one of them know how to do it, well, there's, we, there's a, there's a, that's a sign. There's a trigger. We either need to create a new role, a new system, a new process, something. And so every time something comes up we haven't dealt with, we deal with it. We write down how we dealt with it. We, we, we figure out how we're going to organize this within our overall system. 
and it becomes easier. And that's, you know, again, this has been, you know, this, this is going on for several years. I guess I've been doing this for three years, two and a half years now since I joined up. And um, it's an ongoing, every week we find something new that we can create a new, usually right now we're, we're, we've got most of the roles established. We've got this kind of the overall system in place. Now it's, it's a process. It's a, we go into a new, new municipality and do drawings and submit for permit and their, their requirements are completely different than everybody else we've ever worked with. So now well, actually part of the process is we call them up before we start drawing exactly what do you need. And we create a process for putting together the information they need, how they need it submitted, you know, whether it's electronically, five copies, whatever it is. And so we, we have that established before we start our drawing process. And instead of before we would finish our drawings and call, you know, call, get online, whatever we do and try to submit drawings and find out, well, we need this kind of engineering or we need, you know, this asbestos abatement report, even though the building's not that old, things they required. So the, the processes just make everything easier. And how would you say that that has affected just the overall functioning of the business and the feeling that one has working in the business? It, it you know, dramatically, the business just runs more smoothly. Um, we, we, we haven't grown a whole lot because that wasn't our goal, but we have, we do a, many, a lot fewer projects have a, have a better bottom line than we, than we used to have. The bottom line is, is really going up and my employees, they really enjoy working for me, not because I'm special or anything. It's because they know exactly what to do. They feel empowered and they're allowed to actually make decisions. They can create a new process. If they, if they run across something, they create it, they link it in and then everybody looks at it and goes, this makes sense. What do we need to add? And, and, and they love it. They, they really enjoy being able to have some control over what they do, but also at the same time knowing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And Dan, having the systems mindset and putting up these processes, has this affected your life outside of the business? Yes, it has dramatically. Um, in, the, in the process of putting all this together, I also decided I don't want to be tied down to a spot forever. You know, I didn't want my, my um, day to consist every single day of getting up and being at my office at eight o'clock, staying there all day to 5 p.m., 6 p.m., whatever, going home from work. Uh, um, you know, my children are older. Um, we, we, my wife and I have traveled back and forth between two cities that are about an hour and a half apart. She actually works in a different city than I do. And so as I was putting these processes together, I also upgraded my technology and, and where, how we store our information and all of that. And now I can, you know, I can work from anywhere unless I have to be on a job site in front of a client somewhere. It doesn't matter where I work. As long as I can get a cell phone signal, I can work from anywhere, which is 70% of the time I'm sitting either at my office or, or you know, in, in a conference room somewhere. But if I want to go out into the woods somewhere and work for a couple hours just to get away from everything, I have that flexibility and it's, it's fantastic. I love it. If we want to, you know, get up and and go to another city for, for a long weekend, but I still have a deadline on a Friday. Doesn't matter. I go, I get up Friday morning, I work for a few hours, close the computer, we go do what we want to do. So it's, it's fantastic. And you said that you have an outdoor office that you're sitting in right now and you like to work from there. Show us around, if you can maybe pick up that laptop and just for those who are watching the video, let's get a peek at this workspace yeah, that, that you have. This is actually, this is, I actually have two outdoor offices. This is at my house. This is my back screen porch in, at my at my house in Columbia, South Carolina. And you see we, you know, I have a, a neighbor over there, but on this side, it's all, it's, I don't know what you can see, but it's all woods. It's, it's you know, beautiful sunny day and we get a lot of those in South Carolina. Um, you know, we have a ceiling fan when it gets warm. I can put a little space heater when it gets chilly and I can be out here, you know, almost six months of the year if I choose to come outside and, and work. And then in Charleston, we have a satellite office down there, a very small satellite office down there for when I'm working down in Charleston, South Carolina. And it's basically one room with a big set of sliding glass doors on the back and, and, you know, little, little reception desk in the front. The conference room is also my desk. It's a standing conference room desk. We have some high seats if somebody wants to sit down, but we can open the back doors of this office and slide the conference room table 
right to the door and you're basically standing outside. And again, Charleston, South Carolina, it's usually got some fantastic weather. Um, it's a beautiful city. So that's, you know, that's, it's, it's just something, you know, I like being outside and this allows me the, the flexibility to do that. Dan, you, you mentioned everyone having a systems mindset in the business and identifying processes when they see something that's new and they don't have a systematic or a process for it that they then approach that and they say, okay, how can we set up a, a new role, a system or a process for this? What are some other, maybe one or two of your other key things that you implemented, very key and very specific things that you implemented in your business to get out of the way it was before and enjoy what you have right now? Um, you mean as far as specific processes or? Well, or? I mean, as far as specific things that you implemented, perhaps things that you learned in the architecture firm Freedom Formula program, but a couple things that you implemented that our listeners can take away and say, you know what, if I did that in my business, I could see how that could help me too. Uh, well, yeah, again, the structure and organization is a great thing. Um, having structured meetings, um, again, that, that you, everybody, the meeting is specific time, specific day. You don't miss it. This is exactly what you do. And, and again, the, you know, if you don't have employees, obviously this doesn't help as much, but the employees love the fact that it's, it's tied down. It's specific. They know ahead of time what you're going to talk about because it's on the agenda. That's one of the things that from, from my firm personally, it's helped a lot. Um, one of the things we did in the freedom, freedom form, formula, this, Oh, just a big overall thing is, is write a vision story. And the story took, you know, several weeks. In fact, the story still evolves, but the vision story, and I have two versions of it. I have my personal version of it. And then I have what I call a public version of it that the employees actually see. And it's very specific as to where this business is headed, where I see it going, how I want to work, how I expect them to work, what I want them to get out of their work and having, you know, it's, it's probably, you know, four or five tight pages total, um, it goes into the type of offices we want to have long-term, the technology we use, how we treat our clients, what kind of clients we want. And that is, is huge because it, it allows me to get my vision for the company to my employees. And it always it gives me something to keep going back and, and looking at and saying, well, we've done this and this and this. We're really great over here. We haven't really, we haven't really done this yet. And this is something I'd really want to happen. And it's, it's, it's a good way of going just as a self check. And, it, and it's, it's once you write it out and you start thinking about it, it, it stays in the back of your mind all the time. Um, you have a great idea about something. You don't have time to figure it out, but it's, it, it rolls into your vision story and your plan. And then you wake up at 3 a.m. And instead of going, oh, no, I'm not going to make this deadline. You go, I've got a great idea. I'm going to put that in the vision story and I'm going to implement that tomorrow. So that's the, 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 that vision, that vision and the process we went through of, of looking long-term and seeing where we wanted to head was, was, was big for me. Dan, I really want to dig in a little bit to this idea. You said that for 15 years, you had the business going a certain way and you said your, your income was decent and you were managing the hours, uh, but there was a certain amount of stress. You know, what really was the trigger to not keep on doing it that way because you survived for 15 years like that. So why not just keep on doing things the way you've been doing it for 15 years? Yeah, well, uh, probably the trigger was that, that um, I'd been single for 10 of those 15 years and I got married and I didn't realize how stressed out I was. But after about six months, my wife goes, why do you even do this? You seem to hate it. I go, no, I love it. She goes, no, you, you don't love it. You're, you're, you're miserable. And it really got me thinking that I, I was so accustomed to, to being miserable at running. And again, I love designing. I love drawing something up and putting a little color on it. I love it. But the running the business had become miserable and I had been doing it for so long. I didn't even realize I was miserable. And it made me, it made me realize, you know, why am I doing this? And that's, and that's when I came to the point where I was to, almost to the point where I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it anymore because it was, it wasn't worth the effort, the stress, the, the wear and tear on my loved ones. It, it wasn't. And so, <clears throat> you know, that was, that was really the tipping point when somebody, she almost kind of had to slap me in the face and going, and go, why are you doing this? You're killing yourself. And, and you know, it, 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 it woke me up and said, why am I doing this? You know, I, and my, and at that point it was more my ego keeping me going 
because I don't quit. You know, architects, they're not quitters. They don't quit stuff. We keep going. We go all night and finish what we have to do. And uh, not my, you know, my, my logical brain wasn't involved at all. Uh, my, you know, more emotional and, and reactive. And so the, the, the realization that I was, I was struggling and was, had been doing it for so long that it was just my way of life. You know, it, it was kind of like a slap in the face. And that's when I sat back and went, yeah, guy, I mean, I, I know architects that aren't nearly as stressed out as I am. What are they doing different? There has to be another way to do this. So that's, that's, that, I, I think that was the, the main trigger, I guess, that it got me really searching for some, some alternative ways of running the business. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want to not be an architect. I didn't want to shut down the business, but I didn't want to continue the way I was going either. I've had the opportunity to meet your wife and she is an amazing lady. So that's a great, great testament to her, her, the way she supports you and the way she's able to give you some feedback. Yes. Yes. She's, she's normally extremely sweet, but if I'm being stupid, she's not quite as sweet. She's like, Hey, tell me, think about what you're doing. So Dan, you mentioned that in your office, you have a process for outsourcing. Tell us about that, how it's working for you and what other architects should consider if they're thinking about something similar. It's working well. Now, um, we, we have gone through, we went through probably three or four different groups, organizations that, that offer drafting services. Some of them are big multinational companies. Some of them are small individuals that might do it for themselves or might have two people working for them. And, you know, that was a, that was a, a, really a learning process because we, we said, all right, we, thought, we put together what we thought was a process and a good, good way of doing this. And we brought somebody in and said, we need you to do this. And, you know, 200 questions later, we realized we don't have the process figured out. So, you know, we, so the, the first year we started very small projects and the first few projects were just mainly, you know, they were, they were learning processes, but, but once we got through that learning curve on the first few, we we really had a really good idea of what we wanted, what we needed them to provide for us, how to tell them exactly what we needed. And at that point we could start whittling down the ones that were actually good. They performed well, they did a good job and the ones that didn't because at first we weren't really sure because they didn't know what to do. So that allowed us to narrow it, narrow it down to who we wanted to work with. And now we have, you know, three different drafting firms we work with. Um, of, of our engineer, I've been outsourcing engineering for years, but now I have a process for them to work with and they love it. The ones I've been working with, they go, wow, nobody does this. We know exactly what you want. We know when you want it. We know what, we know exactly what you mean when you ask for a 40% set of drawings because it's all written down. It's in the fee quote, you know, the request for proposal by send them. It's in our, it's on our schedule, everything. And so, so that is, again, that's simplified and it's, it's, it's reduced the number of emails, you know, just that process in place for all our consultants has reduced the number of emails I receive probably by 20%. They just don't have the questions anymore. So not, I might, I may have gotten off subject on that. But. What I, what I hear you saying, Dan, is that you have outline very specifically the deliverables that you expect your consultants to deliver to you. And you've also told them at what stages they need to have certain deliverables, deliverables done. And that's been a game changer. Is, is, am I hearing that correctly? That is correct. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Now looking back, you know, you said you didn't even realize it, but you were kind of at the, at the limit of thinking, Hey, maybe I should go be, you know, a car mechanic or an outdoorsman or a park ranger. <laughs> How do you feel about architecture now at this moment with the way that your business is going? Architecture is fun again. I love being an architect. It's, 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 I get to be an architect because I'm not just putting out fires, solving problems. I, I, I you know, and, and the way the process, I pick and choose which projects I want to really be involved with and which ones I don't. Some of the projects are kind of boring. They're not a bad project, but they're not fun to work with. It's something I can do a little bit of work, turn over to a project manager, let them run with it because they know what to do. And then I get the fun jobs, you know, the ones that need a lot of coloring and things like that. So. Dan, if people want to reach out to you, how would be, what would be the best way to contact you? Um, email would be, be, you know, be fine. Um, it's Dan Scherer at ShareArch.com and then they can call me. That's right. Look them up on the web at, mm -hmm. and the, the website address is ShareArch.com and that is spelled. It's S H E R E R A R C H. Awesome. Dan, thanks so much for joining us today on the business of architecture. You're welcome. Thank you.
And that's a wrap. If you'd like to discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to sign up for a free 90 minute online training on how to do what Dan talked about in today's interview, how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, office management software for architects. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all the profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.